Hello, AP Chemistry students. We're now at section 2.7, which is the last of the unit two sections. And this one is on VSEPR and bond hybridization. So our learning objectives, uh, based on the relationship between Lewis diagrams, VSEPR theory, bond order, and bond polarities, we're going to explain the structural properties of molecules and explain the electron properties of molecules. So there's lots of bits to this, but let's take it one step at a time. So the structure of molecules is determined by valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, otherwise known as VSEPR. And as complicated as this sounds, it has a it's pretty simple Coulomb's law stuff. Uh, basically, electrons repel electrons, and bonds are made out of electrons. Therefore, bonds are going to repel bonds, which means that the geometry of any given molecule is going to be one which maximizes the distance between those bonds, which maximizes the angles between those bonds. In this image here, we have uh, what could be a CH4 molecule, and this is the geometry that it's going to take where you have a central atom connected to four different things. This is going to be the best geometry to maximize the distances between the bonds and the angles between them. Um, and sometimes people ask me, well, why doesn't CH4 uh, form a cross-shaped geometry. And I have a little GIF here of a, a demonstration that I like to do usually um, that represents this. Um, I have uh, four balloons. These all represent bonding orbitals. The, you can imagine that maybe this is like a CH4 molecule. The knot in the center is going to be a carbon. And you imagine that like if it was bound, bound to four hydrogens, the hydrogens would be at the tips of each of the balloons. And the balloons themselves represent the sort of electron clouds. And I force it into a cross-shaped geometry. And then I shake it and put some energy to it, and it automatically rearranges itself into a tetrahedral geometry, uh, much like the geometry we saw in the previous slide. And if we actually look at the measurements, in a tetrahedral geometry, there's going to be a 109.5 degree angle between bonds, whereas in a cross geometry, it's going to be 90 degrees. So this maximizes the angle between the bonds. And speaking of balloons, I'm going to be using these to uh, show a lot of different things about geometries. Um, and the geometry of a molecule is always going to be dependent on the structure and how many bonds extend from the central atom. And if it's not something like methane, if it's a more complex molecule, it's going to depend on the geometry of the backbones of the molecule. So if you have a couple atoms that are chained together, making a larger structure, the overall geometry is going to be influenced by those, uh, those backbone atoms and how many things are extending out of them. Um, and in the next few slides, uh, I'm going to be using balloons to represent bonding orbitals um, to simulate the molecular shapes. And much like in that last example, imagine the knot in the center being a central atom, and then the uh, atoms that it's connecting to would be at the tips of each of the balloons. All right, so if you have a central atom and it's only attached to two other atoms, um, and we're assuming no lone pairs on the central atoms in these cases, uh, we're going to form what's called a linear geometry. This is probably the most obvious one, but we'll have a, an atom in the center and an atom at the edge of each of these balloons. And it'll be all in a line and we'll have a nice 180 degree angle between bonds. If we have a central atom bound to three other atoms, I'm still assuming no lone pairs, um, we're going to have what's called a trigonal planar geometry. Uh, trigonal because it's three, planar, which is because it's flat. Um, so we have a central atom here, and then an atom here, an atom here, and an atom here. And our, bond, uh, our, our bonding orbitals are going to be at 120 degree angles from each other. If I have a central atom attached to four others with no lone pairs, um, much like the example I showed earlier, we're going to have a tetrahedral geometry. Um, understanding what this word means kind of help, will help us understand some of the other geometries later. So what tetrahedral means is four faces. So I know it looks like kind of a a uh, a tripod, but even if you imagine that like you have uh, a point here, a point here, and a point here, and you make that into a triangular face, and then turn this into a pyramid, you'll see that it turns into a four-sided pyramid. Tetra is a prefix that means four, and hedra uh, means face. So this is kind of like a four-faced pyramid. We have three on each side, and then one on the bottom. And in this uh, geometry, we have 109.5 degree angles between the bonds. Uh, if we have a central atom attached to five others with no lone pairs, um, this geometry is going to be called trigonal bipyramidal. Um, and if we break that down, we can kind of see where this comes from. Uh, here we have what looks like a trigonal planar thing in the middle, uh, much like we saw two slides ago. 
Um, we have a central atom here, and then we have three at, uh, atoms coming out of it at 100 degree angles from each other. And then we also have one directly above and one directly below at 90 degrees from this like central plane. And the reason this is called trigonal bipyramidal is if you connected like kind of the three dots at the edge of these balloons, we'd have a three-sided shape. And then we could make a pyramid out of it, which each of these sides. And it's bipyramidal because there's sort of a pyramid on either side of this like middle linear plane. And if I have uh, five, wait, that's a typo. Uh, if we have six, <laughs> six other uh, uh, atoms being attached to the center center with no lone pairs, we're going to have what's called a octahedral geometry. And uh, the reason I explained the tetrahedral thing before is because sometimes people get, ex get confused why this is called octahedral when it's six things being uh, attached to the center. And it's for the same reasons the other one's called tetrahedral. If I tick this center plane where I have these four things kind of in a, 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 a planar arrangement, it's kind of like a square, and then I can make a square pyramid on the top and then a square pyramid on the bottom. And if I think about a double square pyramid, it's kind of like a diamond almost, it's going to have eight faces. So that's why octahedral. And for this, all of the bonds are, bond angles are going to be 90 degrees. Um, so in all of these examples before, I mentioned that there was no lone pairs. Um, because once you have lone pairs, it kind of changes the geometry up a little bit. Um, so imagine here we have a tetrahedral geometry. So we have a carbon bound to four hydrogens. And say uh, I took a similar molecule that had four things coming out of it, but instead of a bond on the top, I have a uh, lone pair of electrons. So this is what's going to be called a trigonal pyramidal uh, type geometry. Uh, this is NH3. This is called ammonia. Um, so we have a lone pair on top, and then we have still that sort of tripod uh, shape on bottom. Um, this is something that is usually referred to as pseudo tetrahedral because it has sort of the same orientation as a tetrahedral thing, except one of the bonds has now been replaced with a lone pair of electrons. But this lone pair of electrons kind of occupies its own electron domain and repels the other bonds in the same way as another bond will. In fact, it repels even more because you'll notice that in a pyramidal geometry, the bond angles around 107 which is uh, less than 109, which means this lone pair on the top kind of squishes down these hydrogens a little bit more and shortens this, this angle between them. And the reason for that is because a lone pair is not going to be stretched as far away from the atom. Um, it's going to be kind of more condensed and more dense, so it's going to have uh, more of a repulsive effect than a bond would. And this is further seen in what's called a bent geometry, like the one in water. Um, this is still pseudo tetrahedral because we have four things coming out of our center oxygen atom. Two of them are bonds, and now two of them are lone pairs. And if we look at the bond angle between the two hydrogen bonds uh, on the oxygen, it's 104.5. So the more lone pairs we add to the molecule, the more it's going to squish the other bonds together. So these are three forms of what are called pseudo tetrahedral geometries. This is the sort of base tetrahedral, replace one of them with a lone pair and we get pyramidal or trigonal bipyramidal, and then replace two of them and we get a bent geometry. And uh, the more, like I said, the more electron pairs that we add to it, the more those bond angles are going to decrease. So for the AP test, um, I don't like to tell students to memorize things. But this chart to the right here is going to be something you're going to want to try to get in your brain as much as possible. Um, and you're going to want to understand all of these geometries. And it seems like a lot, but there's definitely a pattern to it. Um, and there's a reason why I showed you the linear, trigonal, planar, tetrahedral, trigonal, bipyramidal, and octahedral geometries. These are the like sort of base geometries, which involve two to five electron domains. And what I mean by electron domains is either bonds or lone pairs, places where electrons are going to be stored within the molecule. So a linear uh, geometry is going to have two electron domains, trigonal planar is going to have three, tetrahedral four, trigonal bipyramidal five, and octahedral uh, uh, six. Actually, I meant two to six here. Uh, all kinds of typos in this one. All right. Um, and then you'll see to the right here, uh, ignore these electron pair geometries for a second. I'm going to explain those later. Um, we have what are called like the, the pseudo versions of those base geometries. So there's a pseudo version of uh, trigonal planar, which is one of the bent. There's two different kinds of bent. And this is a molecule where you have two bonds and one lone pair. And instead of being linear, 
like this one, this lone pair is going to bend the other bonds down. Um, for the tetrahedral, we have the two pseudo ones that I talked about before, the trigonal pyramidal and the bent, um, both still having four domains coming out of the central atom, but uh, what, this one has one lone pair, this one has two lone pairs. Um, and then where it gets a little bit more complicated is in the uh, five and six electron domain ones. So we talked about the trigonal bipyramidal as being the one that has uh, five electron domains. And if we pull one lone or pull one bond off and replace it with a lone pair, we get what's called a sawhorse. Uh, it's kind of a reference to like a like a seesaw kind of shape. Um, you can imagine that there's like the two seats of the seesaw, and then here's like sort of the fulcrum point. Um, Another one is called T-shaped. This is where we took two bonds off and had two lone pairs instead, and we literally have like a T-shape with 90 degree angles between them. And then if we take off enough bonds, we're just going to have two bonds and then three lone pairs in a sort of a plane in the center, and this is going to get us a linear geometry again. And then for our six electron domain ones, we have our base octahedral one. Um, for this one, we have what's called square pyramidal which has uh, one bond taken off and one lone pair. And it's square pyramidal, because if you can imagine that I tilt this on its side, I have sort of a square on the bottom. And then if you, I connect all these lines here, I have a square pyramid. Um, for this one, square planar, this is two lone pairs, uh, two bonds taken off. And you can see this literally just forms a square. Um, and then T-shaped, kind of similar as the one before up here, um, and then linear. Um, I, I hope you get the picture that I'm, I'm kind of getting at here. Um, all right, uh, so the geometry of the molecule is going to have a big impact on its physical properties, um, mainly the physical properties related to the polarity of the molecule, how it's going to affect the intermolecular forces, which we'll talk about in unit uh, three, I believe. Um, if we have uh, polar covalent bonds in our geometry, it has uh, a chance to make the entire molecule polar. Um, so if I have a dipole and a polar covalent bond, they, they can combine or interfere with each other depending on the geometry. So if I look at this example here, this is called carbon tetrachloride. Um, I have carbon attached to four different chlorines. These are all going to be polar covalent bonds with dipoles pointing towards the chlorines. But if you'll notice that even though these are polar covalent bonds and they're pulling electrons towards the chlorines, they're pulling in opposite directions. Uh, imagine yourself being like in the middle of like four children and all of those children are pulling you in opposite directions. You're not necessarily going to go anywhere because all of those forces are going to cancel out. Um, but in this case, I have, um, this is a molecule of chloroform, I believe, CHCl3. Uh, and this one, uh, I've replaced one of the chlorines with a hydrogen. And in this case, I'm flipping the dipole carbon is more electronegative than uh, hydrogen, so the electrons are going to be pulled towards the carbon. And this makes a huge impact on the molecule, because instead of having uh, an interfering force that's pulling in an opposite direction here, now it's being pushed in this direction. And even though these chlorines are all kind of pushing off in other directions, they're all kind of headed towards the bottom of the molecule. They're all pulling electrons towards the bottom of the molecule. So overall, this makes the entire molecule have what's called a net dipole, an overall dipole. Uh, due to the combination effect of all of these dipoles. If you've ever taken math classes that involve vectors, this is kind of like a vector situation. When you have forces that are all sort of pushing vaguely in the same direction, it's going to make one net force going in that direction. Uh, and this is going to make chloroform overall a polar molecule, because not all of the forces are canceling out like they are in the carbon tetrachloride example. And this is going to affect the intermolecular forces and therefore some of the physical properties, uh, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and then overall, I have sort of a chart here uh, for at least the first uh, the first four or the, the two, three, and four um, electron domain geometries of linear, uh, trigonal planar, and tetrahedral, and how uh, the polar covalent bonds can affect the geometries and make them either polar or nonpolar. Um, for linear, um, that's almost almost always going to be nonpolar unless you have uh, two different atoms being attached to the center atom, where one is more electronegative than the other, and we're going to get a net pole in one direction. You can see uh, in this one, the two dipoles are canceling out, but in this one, the AY bond has a stronger dipole than the AX bond, which is going to make a small pole towards the Y side of the molecule. It's probably going to be pretty weakly polar, though, because these things are in direct opposition to each other. And the only net dipole is going to be whatever the electronegativity difference is between X and Y in this case. Um, 
Bent molecules are almost always going to be polar just because they're inherently asymmetrical geometries. Um, even if X uh, was less electronegative than A and the dipoles were pointing in the opposite direction, you'd still have some sort of net dipole pointing towards one side of the molecule. Uh, trigonal planar geometries, if it's all of the same type of atom being attached to the center, these are always going to be nonpolar because they're all pulling in opposite directions. But uh, much like in the uh, chloroform example, if you replace one of those with a different uh, atom that has a different electronegativity, all of a sudden the forces aren't all going to cancel out and we're going to get um, a polar molecule. Um, same case as before, if we have two different tetrahedral ones, if they're all the same, uh, atom being attached to the center, it's always going to be nonpolar, but as soon as you replace those with something else that has a different electronegativity, you're going to get a, a pole of some sort. All right, uh, now let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit more in depth about how CH4 forms a tetrahedral geometry in the first place, because if we get down and look at the electronic structure of carbon, um, it has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And we think about uh, bonds being due to valence electrons. So the 2s2, 2p2 part of this is going to be our valence shell. In this, we have two electrons that are paired in an s orbital, which are like a sphere shaped, and then two individual electrons in p orbitals. And if you think about uh, what the tetrahedron tetrahedral geometry looks like, and then what the geometries of all of these individual like orbitals look like, it doesn't really make sense because we have sort of a, a sphere in the center, and then say we have one electron in Px and one electron in Py. Uh, Px is oriented along the x-axis, and Py is oriented along the y-axis, and these are going to be 90 degree angles from each other. And then we have these two electrons that are just kind of globbed in the center here. This doesn't really make sense considering what a tetrahedral geometry looks like. Um, so what actually happens is something called hybridization or bond hybridization. We're going to be forming what are called hybrid molecular orbitals. Because in CH4, if you think about it, the, all of those carbon-hydrogen bonds need to be equal. They need to be the same type of bond, which means that we need to take our, our current electron configuration, our current uh, orbital configuration, and turn it into something where our valence shell forms four equal energy orbitals instead of one uh, 2s and then two occupied 2p orbitals. And what ends up happening is something called hybridization. If you think about what hybridization means, hybridization is when you are blending multiple things. So there's a phenomenon that happens where uh, orbitals within an atom start to blend and form new orbitals that are sort of uh, equal. You can imagine that you took like, it's kind of like making a smoothie. You took a bunch of different ingredients that were different, threw them in a blender, and then you end up with sort of a homogenous mixture of the things that you blended up. In this case, we're blending up orbitals. And in this case, we're blending up the valence shell orbitals. So since we needed four equal energy orbitals, we needed to make four new orbitals. Luckily, we have four uh, orbitals to work with and four electrons to work with for carbon. So we're gonna take our 2s orbital, um, and then our three 2p orbitals, even though one of these p's isn't occupied, it's fine. We're going to take these three p orbitals and this one s orbital, we're going to throw them all in a blender, and what we're going to end up with is four new orbitals that are all at equal energy, that are all a blend of the four things that went into it. And since what went into it was one s and three p's, we're going to call these sp3 orbitals, or sp3 hybrid molecular orbitals. And this is how we can get our tetrahedral geometry, because now that once we have four equal things that all contain one electron, because we could redistrib redistribute the electrons we had in the orbitals before into these four new orbitals, we're going to get four equal energy bonding orbitals. And since those orbitals are made of electrons, those four things are going to repel each other equally, and therefore we get the tetrahedral geometry that we get out of it. And when we make bonds with these, we're going to have bonds that directly overlap with the uh, the hybrid orbitals of whatever is being bonded to. And the single bonds that form in this fashion, where we just have a direct overlap of hybrid molecular orbitals, these are called sigma bonds. So let's consider another situation. Let's consider uh, a molecule of formaldehyde. In formaldehyde, we have a carbon in the center, we have two hydrogens coming out of it, and we have uh, a double bonded oxygen. 
So this is going to form a trigonal planar geometry because we have three electron domains and they're all going to want to get as far away from each other as possible, which uh, I'll remind you is a 100 degree, 120 degree angle. Um, and much like the CH4 example, the default atomic orbitals we had, those uh, those S and P orbitals as, as they, they come in their default state, isn't going to get us to a trigonal planar situation. So much like the CH4 example, we're going to form some molecular uh, some hybrid molecular orbitals. But this case, since we only needed to make three equal energy orbitals, um, we're going to ignore that double bond for now. We're not going to need to throw all four of our valence shell orbitals into the mix. We're going to take our S, and then we're going to take two of our P orbitals, um, and we're going to leave one behind. So we take our S and our two Ps, we blend them together, and we would get what's called a sp2 hybrid orbital. So we have these three now equal energy orbitals, and they're all going to be, uh, they're all going to repel each other. And since they're three domains, we're going to end up with a trigonal planar geometry. And in this case, we consider the carbon in this to be sp3 hybridized, and we can form three sigma bonds with this. Um, whereas with the, uh, the sp3 example before, we could form four sigma bonds. And since only two of the three p orbitals were used, we have one p orbital left over. And that's important, actually, because that extra p orbital is what's going to make the double bond. So consider this situation here, where we have two uh, sp2 hybridized carbons that are in their like uh, trigonal planar geometry with their bonding orbitals. Um, we have a sigma bond here with a hydrogen, another sigma bond here with a hydrogen, and then another sigma bond here with a carbon overlapping. And then these two lobes here represent the p orbital that was not used. And let's look at this other carbon. It's, it's hybridized the same way. Um, this is a molecule of uh, C2H4, by the way. It's not the formaldehyde molecule. Um, but we'll, we're going to have these two leftover p orbitals from these two sp2 hybridized uh, carbons. And what ends up happening is these two molecular orbitals that are sort of out of the plane, these can sort of bend in to meet um, to make what's called a pi bond. And this is how double and triple bonds are formed. It's formed from leftover p orbitals that weren't used in the hybrid orbital blending step. Um, the second and third bonds that you form are not quite as strong because they're not directly in the plane. Um, an analogy I always give for this is like, say you're standing next to somebody, you're side by side, and you reach out to grab their hand. That connection between your two hands is going to be pretty strong if you hold on tightly. But then imagine you take your, your other hand that's not holding their hand, and you try to reach it over your head to form another uh, connection with them. And they do the same thing. They reach over with their other hand that's, not, that's farther away from you, and you try to make another grip um, like overneath over your head, the, the connection between those is just not going to be as strong since it's not in the plane in which you're standing. So pi bonds are not as strong as sigma bonds, but it's the only way that we can get double and triple bonds between atoms. All right, let's look at another case of acetylenes, C2H2. Um, in this one, we have linear carbons because each of the carbons is going to form two electron domains. Once again, we're going to ignore this triple bond here and just uh, think about this bond and this bond here. They're linear. They have 180 degrees between them. And since we need to form two equal energy orbitals this time, we're only going to need two of our valence orbitals. So we're going to take our S and then we're going to take one of our P's and we're going to blend them together and we get what's called an SP hybrid orbital. And in our sp hybrid orbital, uh, we have two p orbitals left over. So we're going to be able to form two sigma bonds with our carbon, with our two uh, equal energy sp orbitals that are in our linear shape. Um, and then those two p orbitals that we have left over are going to be sort of uh, above, uh, above and below, and then sort of in and out of the page. You can imagine that one's going to be like here, one, one p orbital, and then the other one's going to be like kind of coming out of the page and going in to the page. And those two p orbitals are left over to make two pi bonds. And that's how both of these carbons are able to make a double and then triple bond, utilizing those, those free p orbitals that weren't involved in the hybridization step. So in this case, this carbon is going to form two sigma bonds, the original connection between this hydrogen and then this carbon. And then these two double bonds are going to be made out of the two pi bonds using the two leftover p orbitals. Um, so to summarize what this looks like for each of our uh, our sp, our sp 
and our sp3 cases. In sp3, we take our valence shell, we take all of our orbitals, our s and our three p's, we blend them all together to get four equal energy sp3 orbitals. Um, these inner shell electrons don't do anything, so we kind of just ignore those. And this allows us to make four sigma bonds. Um, for uh, things that are sp2 hybridized, we're going to take our s and two of our p's, blend them together to get three equal energy orbitals. Um, and these are going to form that trigonal planar geometry. Um, and we can form uh, three sigma bonds. And then we're going to have one leftover p orbital in which we can make uh, pi bonds with. And then uh, if we have two equal energy bonding orbitals, um, we're only going to need two of our valence shells. So we're going to take an S and one of our P's, blend them together. We end up with two equal energy SP orbitals and then two P orbitals left over, which we can make two more pi bonds with. So in this case, we can form two single bonds, and then we can either form two double bonds or one triple bond in this case. So now let's look at this molecule here, acetonitrile. This is what a lot of uh, like chemistry gloves are made out of. Um, let's 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 go piece by piece of all of the backbone atoms in this molecule and try to figure out what their hybridization is, and then overall figure out how many sigma and pi bonds are in this molecule. So let's look at this carbon here. This carbon here is bound to four other things. So we can assume since it has four electron domains, it's going to need to have a tetrahedral geometry. Um, and a tetrahedral geometry is going to need to be sp3 hybridized because we need four equal energy orbitals to make these four equal energy bonds with. This carbon here, uh, it's bound to two things. It has two electron domains, so it's going to be linear. And to get a linear geometry, we're going to need a sp hybridization, which is going to have uh, two p orbitals left over. Um, and then let's think about this nitrogen. This is still considered part of the backbone. Um, and you can imagine that there's a lone pair on this side of the nitrogen that is not shown here. And that lone pair is going to be its own electron domain. So it's going to have one electron domain here and then one here to overlap with the carbon. Um, so this is also going to be sp hybridized. So this is also going to have two p orbitals left over to bond with. And the two p orbitals on this nitrogen and then the two p orbitals on this carbon are going to sort of overlap and make two pi bonds. So overall, we have one, two, three, four sigma bonds from this carbon. Um, we're going to have a sigma bond between the carbon and the nitrogens. So that's five total sigma bonds. And then we're going to have two pi bonds from the nitrogen here. And this slide, uh, you can pause. This is just going to be sort of a summary of everything I just said. All right. Um, so in a previous, uh, in, in the previous uh, slides, I was talking about how uh, you can form geometries that are more than four electron domains. There was the trigonal biopyramidal and the octahedral geometries, which involved five and six electron domains. Um, these can only really happen with things like phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. And I sort of hinted at this in the uh, Lewis structure and resonance uh, lectures. Um, if you're forming more than four bonds, you're going to need more than an octet because each of the uh, bonds is two electrons, so you're going to need to have atoms that can form more than an octet, uh, or what we call an expanded octet. And this happens with phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, and then atoms that are heavier than those in those same groups. And the reason is because those are in the third period, and the third shell is when you first have access to d orbitals. So we can make even more complicated hybridized orbitals. Um, we can form sp3d and sp3d2 hybrid orbitals, where it's sort of the same procedure as before. We're blending our, 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 our valence orbitals. But in the cases where you have five electron domains, we're throwing one d orbital into the mix. And then the one where we have six, we're going to form, or we're going to throw two d orbitals into the mix. And we're going to call those sp3d and sp3d2 hybridizations. Um, I don't think these d hybridizations are on the AP test. And there's actually disagreement among actual scientists of whether this is actually how it works or not. But this is sort of the best explanation that we have at the moment. So uh, just as a summary of all of these geometries, um, I kind of said ignore this column before, but now you can see that this is sp, sp2, sp3, d, sp3, same thing as sp3d, or d2, sp3. Um, and they all correspond to the number of domains. So 
Uh, two domain things are always going to be SP. Three domain things are always going to be SP2. Four domain things are always going to be SP3. Five domain things are always going to be SP3D or DSP3. And then six domain things are always going to be SP3D2 or D2, SP3. So all of these are going to have the same hybridization. All of these are going to have the same hybridization and so forth. Um, and just as a quick little uh, practice, let's think about what kind of geometry NH3 would have. Um, if I was to draw an NH3 molecule, um, that's going to look a lot like the one we saw much earlier here. Uh, we have N connected to three hydrogens. And even though you might look at the formula NH3 and think that, uh, oh, well, that's going to be three bonds and therefore three domains and therefore trichinal planar, we got to remember that if we actually draw the Lewis structure, the nitrogen is going to have a lone pair on it. So that's going to be four domains, which is going to be sp3. And the other one I asked about was water. And I kind of talked about this before as well, but even though it's H2O and it's two actual bonds, uh, there's also two lone pairs on the central oxygen. So it's also going to have four domains. So the oxygen is also going to be sp3 hybridized in that case. Um, and that is all for this lecture. Um, this was a bit of a long one, but um, I, hope, uh, I hope this was helpful. So I'll see you in unit three.